In our last segment, uh, I talked a bit about the policies of the Roosevelt administration and sort of the progressivism of the Roosevelt administration and, and argued that Roosevelt had maintained what you'd expect from a progressive, a sort of middle way that avoided extremes. He's not a radical. As much as he's about reform, as much as Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt or Theodore Roosevelt is about change, it's not a sort of radical change. He relies on experts, he relies on commissions, and seeks often arbitration or limited change that protects the interests of sort of the middle class of American society. Uh, if we go back to the, the great coal strike, for instance, in many ways, I think Roosevelt's interest was neither the owners of the mines, the very wealthy, or the workers in the mines, but it was finding a solution to their problem that would then allow him to ensure coal would be available for the middle class and the bulk of the people of the United States. It's a very politically uh, advantageous position, I, I, I would guess. In this next segment, I really want to talk more, uh, continue talking about the politics of progressivism, but I want to push it beyond the Roosevelt administrations. Remember that Roosevelt comes to the presidency upon William McKinley's assassination. And it won't be until 1904 that Roosevelt will run on his own. Uh, he runs against Alton Parker, who's from New York and a relatively lifeless candidate, and Roosevelt does reasonably well. Uh, he, he seems to have the backing of the American people, at least enough to get the presidency. But there are a few things that happen with this second term that are worth noting. Early on, uh, Roosevelt had tended to be very much about that middle way. There are elements in his second administration that allowed some of his own party even to begin wondering if, if Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, wasn't becoming a bit more radical and radicalized. In, in other words, whether in his second term, Roosevelt hadn't pushed beyond sort of this progressive middle way. That dubiousness, that questioning of whether Roosevelt was uh, getting a bit more radical, came in part from a promise that Roosevelt had made. When he ran in 1904, Theodore Roosevelt had basically said that he would not be a candidate in 1908. And anytime a candidate makes that pledge, they begin their administration or their tenure in office at a certain disadvantage. On the other hand, it's liberating. It's a disadvantage because your opponents, other political people understand that uh, you're only, you only have a certain amount of time and they only have to listen to you so much or for so long or care about what you think. But it's liberating in the sense that you don't have to worry about what other people think. You know, you know you're going to do one term and you're in the office, so do whatever you can then. And I think to some extent that's how Roosevelt approached this and perhaps this freedom allowed him then to be more expansive in his goals as progressive president of the United States. But it also means that Roosevelt will have to be thinking about who uh, should succeed him following uh, his second administration. Ultimately, Roosevelt sort of handpicks a fellow by the name of William Howard Taft of Ohio. And over the years, historians and the public have in some ways given Taft perhaps a bad rap. At least that's the way I'm going to look at Taft here. It's not perhaps the most uh, accepted argument, and as always, you're more than welcome to disagree with what I'm arguing here. But I've been, when I was going through graduate school and, and reading up on, on William Howard Taft, among other presidents, one of the arguments that really caught my attention was that Taft was sort of a forgotten progressive that in many ways uh, Taft qualifies among this sort of group of progressive presidents of which Roosevelt was one. And it makes sense then that Roosevelt would look to Taft basically to carry, o carry on Roosevelt's own policies. Taft had served in the cabinet uh, with Roosevelt. He had served as an executive, as a governor in the Philippines. Um, 
He's a fascinating man who would go on then to become a justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. By a fascinating man, it's hard not to acknowledge uh, William Howard Taft's girth. He was a large man by just about any standard, uh, well into the 300 pounds. It was a sign, I suppose, of his affluence and in some ways you could argue his seeming affability. But that aside, it's going to be William Howard Taft who now in 1908 will carry the progressive banner. And his opposition is an old friend of ours. He just kind of keeps coming back in our story of, of American history here, and that's William Jennings Bryan. You remember Bryan had run for president in 1896. He'd run again against McKinley. And here he is again in 1908 with Theodore Roosevelt out of the way, now seeking the presidency against William Howard Taft. Well, Taft wins. And almost immediately, there are questions about whether or not Taft is a progressive indeed. Roosevelt, having left the presidency, uh, will travel, and among other things, he will go off on safari. Taft becomes involved uh, in policies that get him labeled a bit of a conservative, not even a progressive reformer, but a conservative. One of the key things he deals with is the tariff. Now, I don't know if in the lectures that I've done, we've talked about the tariff, but the simplest definition of the tariff, T-A-R-I-F-F, -F, is a duty or tax on imported goods goods that are being brought into the United States for resale. Taft pledges to cut the tariff, which is basically what progressives and progressive Republicans want. But more conservative Republicans, more sort of McKinley-esque Republicans, do not wish to see tariff cuts. In the end, Taft caves, caves in, to these more protectionist-minded Republicans and ends up passing the so-called Payne-Aldrich Tariff, 1909, which will raise tariffs on some really important resources like iron and coal and other industrial items. Then, when progressive Republicans sort of challenge this old guard for control of the House of Representatives, Taft supports the progressive campaign, and then he seems to abandon the progressives so that conservatives move to gain control, conservative Republicans move and gain control of the House of Representatives. And then there is the so-called Pinchot-Ballinger affair. This involves our old friend Gifford Pinchot, who is chief of the United States Forest Service. And basically what happens is that one of Taft's cabinet appointees, uh, Richard A. Ballinger, who was Secretary of the Interior, kind of gets into a disagreement with Pinchot. Ballinger was a corporate lawyer. Over the removal of land from federal protection. This is forest land and land that's preserved for mining. Taft removes a million acres. Gifford Pinchot protests the removal and for his efforts he is fired. 1910. Roosevelt, you may recall, has been away. He's been in Africa, you know, hunting animals, big game, because he's got to prove himself to be a man, I suppose, masculine. And he begins to hear inklings that Taft is not pursuing the policies of a progressive as 
Theodore Roosevelt understands progressivism. He understands the role of the president. And he is very much taken aback at his hand-chosen successor and his actions. That's where I think Taft really gets into trouble in terms of being considered a progressive. There are things that Taft does, arguably because he was sort of weak-willed even. I don't think that's the case, but arguably so. He's weak-willed. He gives in. But in other fundamental ways, I think you can argue that Taft is very much progressive-minded. And let me just give you some evidence to kind of back up my argument here, and you decide what you want. Taft, and during his administration, prosecuted more trusts than Roosevelt, and even went after important trusts like U.S. Steel that Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, had assumed were okay, that were to the good. In other words, remember Roosevelt, Roosevelt, he made a, a delineation between good trusts and bad trusts. My point is that Taft and his administration looked to more trusts as bad, as combinations unreasonably restraining trade. Taft expands the national forests. He bolsters the power of the Interstate Commerce Commission through Man Elkins in 1910. Taft supports legislation or legislative initiatives to institute the eight-hour day and mine safety. Roosevelt wouldn't go that far. But Taft goes even further, maybe beyond progressivism, maybe going so far that he would meet the charges that were made against Theodore Roosevelt for radicalism because Taft supports the introduction of an amendment to legalize, an amendment to the Constitution to legalize a federal income tax for the direct election of senators. That's been a big deal since we talked about the Knights of Labor, since we talked about the Farmers Alliance. And here's Taft coming on board and saying, yeah, I would, I would favor that, I would help with that. Now, whether he would or not, we may not know, but he says he would. And yet, to most progressives, Taft seemed vacillating. He seemed a tool of the conservatives. He seemed like a poor progressive. Theodore Roosevelt is incensed. And he determines that he is going to come back in 1912 and this Theodore Roosevelt Republican and progressive will run against William Howard Taft who's apparently let Roosevelt down, but he's also a fellow Republican. And in the next segment, we'll pick up then with the election of 1912 and how this spat between Roosevelt and Taft is ultimately settled.